Can everybody hear me all right? Okay, fantastic. Thanks, thanks everybody for coming out. This is fantastic. Uh, early Friday morning, I try to get my students at the Yuska Kunst Academy to come to classes at 9, and it's an incredible challenge. Maybe I need to offer coffee and, and cakes. Um, I put this up here just to put this thought in the back of your heads um, throughout the talk I'm giving today. Whenever I hear this word creativity or use the word creativity, I think of it in these terms. I think of it in terms of social justice, social mobility, um, and creativity being used to make a more egalitarian, uh, better place for artistic practice for other people. I should back up a second and thank uh, Goatsbannon for having us today, and thank you, uh, Creative Mornings, Orhus, Renee, and Abdul for inviting me to do this. I work with a group called Temporary Services, in addition to teaching at the Yuska Kunst Academy here in, in Aarhus. We're a group of artists. Um, this is something that's been kind of a part of our approach to making art for a very long time. The difference between art and other forms of creativity is irrelevant to us. And I think you'll get a sense of that in the two projects I'm presenting to you today. I'll try to do it very quickly. Uh, there are three of us working together, myself, Salem College Julian in Philadelphia, and Mark Fisher in Chicago, where we all started out. So temporary services makes art collaboratively. We work together in our group. We work with other people outside of our group. We work with artists. We work with people in prison. We work with a, a wide range of people to make artistic practices. We write about aesthetics, ethics, politics, and public art, both as a group and individually. I have an article coming out uh, in the Danish magazine Critique uh, early next year about the Super Keelan Park in Copenhagen. We create exhibitions and projects around the work of others. It's very important that we use our own cultural capital to lift other people who maybe aren't so good at mobilizing it themselves. We publish over 96 books, booklets, posters, booklets, and newspapers. We're absolutely obsessed with publishing. I'm gonna show you two book projects today. Uh, we're so obsessed with publishing in 2008, we started our own imprint and online store, Half Letter Press, to create an economic engine for supporting the kind of work we do, printing material by people who might be politically provocative, who might be socially marginalized, who might be experimenting with forms that aren't getting mainstream attention. We make exhibitions of our books. This was at uh, Overgaden in, in Copenhagen last, no, earlier this year uh, for a book exhibition. Here's a selection of our titles, so you get a, just a quick sense of some of the things we've published in the past few years. Like I said, it's over, I think it's 97 publications. We just had two things come out last month. So I'm gonna share with you today two projects that kind of bookend our practice, something that's very early and kind of ongoing given the nature of the collaboration and, and one of our more recent publications. So Prisoner's Inventions is a project we've been uh, realizing with a friend of ours who's incarcerated he was in a maximum security prison in California for 25 years. He's now in a jail in California on his way out of the, the, the system. We've been collaborating with him since about 2001, 2002 on this project. We asked him to describe things that prisoners made uh, in prison to cope with the harsh realities of American prison system. It's the largest prison system in the world, uh, not per capita, but just by number of people. There's something like 2,300,000 people uh, in prison, half the population of Denmark almost, in, pr in US prisons. And they're not, they're, not, they're not friendly places. We learned of these inventions through correspondence with Angelo through this ongoing conversation we had with him about prison life, about our own work. And we made a book. Um, we were initially gonna make a zine with him, but he sent us so much material that we had to make a publication. And we've got an additional material to make maybe um, a publication twice the size of the original book we made. That was the cover I showed you before. This is to give you a sense of what's in the book. Um, 
Prisoners invent things to do a wide range of things to cover a wide range of needs. Here's a way to make a grilled cheese sandwich in your cell using the built-in steel furniture. This is a chair and this is a desk. This is called a toilet paper bomb. And you basically make it by taking the toilet paper, wrapping it around your hand several times, and you turn it inside out. You light it on fire and place it underneath your steel furniture and cook a sandwich. I mean, quite extreme, right? Um, but this is an extreme place we're talking about here with very limited resources. What's really nice is Angela is a self-taught artist, um, and he initially didn't approach this project as an art project. Uh, we had to really convince him to do it. He very much got into it and kind of became an oral historian of these practices. He's, he was very thorough. You can see like throughout the book, and um, Angelo gives cautions or warnings to using some of these inventions as if we're going to use them ourselves. Note uh, that these uh, bombs are a mess to use. They blister and scorch the paint, blacken the shiny steel, steel fill the cell with eye-watering smoke and gases, and if the cell exhaust isn't, isn't working, it will set off the smoke alarm and probably bring in a guard and get you in a lot of trouble. So maybe not an invention you should use very frequently. <laughs> this is a stinger or an immersion heater, just a way of boiling water. Uh, it's made of three toothbrushes, the handles here, one across, melted to one and two to give it support. These metal pieces, um, they are from paper binders. You, you uh, use them to hold papers and you kind of push them through and fold them out. They're broken off and kind of put in a line together and held on with rubber bands. And what you do is you stick this into a cup of water and you plug it into a US standard socket. And within about a half hour, you get hot water. It's very brown hot water. So maybe it's best if you make coffee uh, with this. So, so you kind of mask the hot water that you're getting. This is um, one of the replicas we made of the invention and tried out. It corrodes within the first use. You can see this is pretty severe corrosion that happens. But if you want to heat water in your cell, you don't have a hot pot, they're banned. This is a way to sort of solve that problem. What you're looking at here is um, a detail from an exhibition. We presented these inventions and Angelo's work in our collaboration together in, in several exhibitions. I'll show you slides of that in a second. But since these are all contraband, we couldn't get them out of prison. We had to use our skills as artists to recreate the inventions. And Angelo's directions are incredibly um, accurate and precise. Everything we tried, everything that we could make functioned. So we present the inventions, about 40 to 50 of them, in a vitrine alongside Angelo's drawing and text. Kind of like this, you'll see in the next uh, image, in a series of vitrines. It's a very immersive exhibition. It takes a long time to get through it. Here are several of the locations we presented it, presented this work in. I'll show you a couple more examples of, of inventions. California was the first state in the United States to ban public smoking. And ironically enough, a prison is a public, considered a public place in California. So a smoking ban went into effect there. Inmates could only smoke outside in the yard. So lighters, matches, ways of lighting cigarettes were all banned. So there, you see this incredible amount of effort going into making cigarette lighters. And this is one of the simpler ones. It's uh, two D batteries are kind of put together, wrapped with tape. You grab uh, a wire from some other source. You've taken this from a different um, piece of electronic equipment. You get a heating element from either a hot water heater or a toaster. And this is where um, you light your cigarette. So you basically tape it to the bottom. And when you want to light a cigarette, you, you touch the end of the wire to the top, and this starts glowing. And it works. Uh, this maybe lights three or four cigarettes. It's not very efficient. I guess if you're really desperate to light a cigarette, this is the way to go. You also see a warning here. The batteries wear out very fast, so this is an affluent inmate's toy. It's sort of um, letting other inmates know that maybe this isn't the most cost-effective way to light your cigarettes. Here's the one that we made and used. So along with eating and smoking, there's also many inventions to just fill your time with entertainment, mental stimulation like chess. So you see a lot of 
variations of chess, chess boards. This was the most elaborate one that we were presented with. It, um, it was made out of paper mache pieces and had this very elaborate cardboard box that was made to sort of fold up and hold the pieces inside of it. You kind of can get a sense of it here. The coloring is just a child's uh, fruit drink, um, sugary fruit drink used to color the pieces. But very simple, uh, toilet paper and sugar water. Makes a very durable uh, chess set. I bet you can figure out what this is. <laughs> of course there are sex dolls. Of course there are this kind of thing uh, in prison. We were kind of amazed to get this in, drawing in the mail and some of the other homemade sex toys. Uh, we made a conscious decision not to include weapons in our book. We're really focusing on these other things to kind of give attention to people articulating their daily needs within American prisons. This was a, a, a nice surprise uh, for us. This was actually made in mind. Um, they had Angelo's cellmate at the time in mind for this, this particular design. Um, often, in the US, there's no discussion publicly, a very, or healthy discussion about sex. Maybe you get a sense of this through media coming to Denmark. Conversations about sex in prison are always about male-on-male uh, about -male rape and sodomy. It's sort of um, very brutal stories of sexuality. When sexuality in prison um, is, is way more complicated than that, a lot more people abstain than I think popular media portrays. Um, and then you have these things. I imagine several of you have seen images like this before. I bet these have been made in Danish prisons. Um, these are quite common. It's a tattoo gun. You take an old cassette uh, Walkman motor and you attach a sharpened paper clip. These are pieces scavenged from a pen so the paper clip can be held and move rapidly through, through there and then you attach it to uh, either an AC current or um, via batteries or an adapter pack that you've modified. And it gives tattoos. It gives really, uh, really not so nice tattoos, but as you can imagine, I mean, just looking at it. <laughs> and if you have, had, have tattoos, you might, yeah, you wouldn't want them with this thing. Um, it works. And we made several versions of these and, and gave ourselves small tattoos just to see how it, how it, uh, how it functioned, and it's quite, uh, quite inventive. There are many ways of giving tattoos. I taught um, art history in a prison for three years. I had one student who was like a, a museum of really bad ways of tattooing yourself. <laughs> I showed him this project, and he came up to me after class, ripped his shirt off, stood in my face, and just started showing me all of his, ta his various tattoos made with some incredible materials. But it's a huge part of prison culture, just about anywhere you go. Angelo wanted people to get the strong psychological context for the production of these inventions. So he wanted us to make a replica of his prison cell. This is one of several drawings, very detailed drawings he made of his cell so we could make the replica. This is the, the chair and, and desk on which we saw images of cooking earlier. Here's our replica of the prison cell. Um, it sort of stands alone like this. You kind of get a sense of just how claustrophobic this space is. It took my breath away the first time I walked into it, and I couldn't imagine there being two people living in this space for 20 years. It's kind of um, amazing. We had it built strong enough that people could do this, come in. Uh, this guy actually took a nap um, on it, but we, we made it so it was very durable so people could interact with it. So when you see this work, you go into this immersive environment, you have a replica of the cell, you have the inventions in the vitrines, you have videos demonstrating some of the inventions showing that they do work. We've made a library as well, a reading room, for more information about prisons. And so it takes quite some time to get through this, um, this presentation. All right. Oh yeah, one last thing I wanted to say is that these folks are very much using creativity to survive, to survive the boredom, to survive the humiliation, to survive the intense lack of communication with the outside, to survive uh, loneliness, a variety of things. We found evidence of this kind of behavior across culture and across time. 
in, in various research that we've done, we found prisoners' inventions in, in, uh, in prisons in Thailand and Australia, in the UK and France and Brazil. Also in uh, concentration camps, uh, uh, you have lots of examples of people making inventions um, to either, in some cases, rebel against the prison guards, in other cases, just to survive and make some kind of sense out of the conditions you find yourself in. All right, so I'm gonna show one last project. How am I doing on time? Five minutes, okay, I'm gonna go really quickly through this. This is a recent publication we made called Mobile Phenomena. We spend a lot of time documenting people's behavior in city spaces, and we're really interested on, in things that people put on wheels or make mobile to increase social mobility, to make an economy, to do a variety of things, some very undescribable things. I don't know if anybody's seen this guy in Madrid, Punky. Has anybody seen Punky? Uh, he's in a, usually in a square outside of Del Prado um, in the center of Madrid. What you're looking at here is, um, the, actually the actor is sitting inside the, this backpack here. Um, th this sort of serves as a chair, he's sitting down, his legs are here. One hand comes out here and the other hand is moving the puppet, uh, puppet's head. So this is like a, pu this is a puppet and it's a very, um, abusive old punk rocker who insults you, um, performs for you, chases you, tries to kick you. It's quite entertaining, uh, but in incredibly inventive invention, or not, yeah, inventive um, way of calling attention and, and performing and getting money. This thing blew us away the first time we saw it. This is a 114 speed bicycle and mobile home made by a fellow named Brian Campbell, and he's quite a legend on the the west coast of the United States. He's been spotted riding this bike up and down the coast all the way from Vancouver to uh, Tijuana and back and forth. He lives in it, he cycles in it. He was inspired by space travel and lightweight construction, as you can kind of get a sense. One last thing to show you and then I'm done. I appreciate your attention. Um, this is a, a fairly recent action, still unfolding in the UK, but there's an organization called Liberate Tate, which is trying to get uh, the Tate Museum to, and other cultural institutions in the UK to stop taking money from British Petroleum, to stop using cultural, uh, cultural institutions to make their image look better, you know, particularly after this massive Gulf spill, uh, this massive spill in the Gulf of Mexico. What these folks did was they, they found an old um, decommissioned windmill blade, they put, they, they took it in three parts, they put wheels on it, they paraded it through London, across the bridge that leads to the Tate. They pushed their way into um, the turbine hall, which you see here, they reassembled it. And then what's brilliant about it was they submitted it as a work of art uh, to the board of directors, which by British law had to consider it for their collection. Um, the video is quite beautiful, this whole campaign is quite human, quite um, important set of questions they're asking uh, about holding corporate sponsors accountable, holding cultural institutions accountable. Um, anyways, that's, the, uh, that's it for me. I appreciate you all listening to me in this rapid fire presentation. I hope you have a good day and thanks.